In this narrated PowerPoint, we will talk about handling conflict. I wish somebody had taught me about conflict early on in my ministry. I think that I could have done a much better job dealing with it if I had only been trained in how to handle conflict. Today, we're going to be talking about that subject, and I pray that God will use this in a significant way in your life to help you handle this issue. On this slide, you see a quote from Max Licato. It says, and I quote, Conflict is inevitable, but combat is optional. Close quotes. Conflict is sure to happen, and it's unavoidable in the church and in your personal life. However, it does not have to turn into combat when both sides are attempting to inflict wounds on each other. So, let's turn our attention to this very important subject. What should you expect to learn as a result of listening to and watching this presentation? Well, you will learn a church leader's primary role in resolving conflict. The leader really does have an essential part in helping to take some of the sting out of conflict that may arise in the congregation and help restore unity. You will also learn a working definition of conflict. The definition will help you as you, as you deal with conflict in your professional and personal life. Then we will examine four biblical causes of conflict. Yes, we even find conflict appearing on the pages of the Bible. Last, we will examine three ways individuals can respond to conflict. Now let's get started. God and Satan have conflicting priorities. God wants harmony and unity to be found through the love of Christ, and he wants that unity or that oneness to be seen in the church. He also wants it to be seen in our individual relationships with one another. John 13:35 says, and I quote, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Close quotes. In Philippians 1.27, the Bible says, and I quote, Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. Close quotes. And so there's to be a unity that would be described as if we were one person, unified, moving forward with the gospel of Christ Jesus. And so God has a priority. It's harmony and unity found through the love of Christ. However, Satan's priority is quite different. That is to destroy the witness and the influence of the church. One of the most effective strategies he uses is conflict. Since there are competing priorities, there's a problem. Since we're not in heaven, we'll find it almost impossible to consistently arrive at unity in most areas of thought and purpose without some kind of conflict and resistance. You see, Satan's primary mode of operation is to stimulate Christian egos against each other. Paul expressed this to the elders in Ephesians. In Acts chapter 20, verse 30, he is quoted as saying, Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the scripture says, and I quote, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith, and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons, close quote. So there is a problem. It's a problem of priorities. God's priorities or Satan's priorities? Which are we going to follow in the church and in our individual lives? What role does the church leader play in bringing harmony and unity to the congregation? 
ministry, or the organization? Well, first, leaders need to anticipate problems. Be aware of the fact that problems which blindside you will be even more devastating, and the intensity of those problems will be greater. Listen to those leaders in your congregation or your ministry. Get their heart. When they begin to talk to you, listen. Listen closely so that you can anticipate problems. Learn to manage conflict. You will not do away with conflict. That will it is inevitable. But when conflict arises, learn how to manage it. You can learn to manage conflict by bringing people together, getting them to talk about their differences. You can learn to manage conflict by helping people direct the energy that they're using to fight each other in a more productive way, investing that energy in ministry. And then you have a responsibility to guide conflict away from disunity and toward understanding. One of the things I know is that we need to understand other people. We may not agree with their point of view, but we owe it to them to understand where they're coming from. And in many cases, that will help us to reach the point of solving a relational or personal conflict with someone else. When I'm dealing with a conflicted situation, I always go into the conversation with an attempt to understand that person. And then I presume that they are going to try to understand my perspective as well. But whether they understand me or not, I have an obligation to understand them and their point of view. If my perspective is accurate, then they need to change some things in their lives. But if their point of view is accurate, then I need to change my mind to do what is right in the situation. This slide demonstrates a good working definition of the word conflict. Conflict is a difference in opinion or purpose that frustrates someone else's goals or desires. Frustration can mean to anger someone, to block them, to put a stop to, to disappoint, or to nip in the bud. So conflict can be as simple as an opinion or a purpose that causes anger in someone else. Here's an interesting question. Is there a spiritual dimension to most conflict when it arises in the church? The answer, yes. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 11, we read these words. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Notice the word schemes. It's a word that also could be translated strategies. The devil has targeted the church with his most effective strategies. Now, in the New Testament, we discover that conflict is found on numerous pages, and there was great potential for division even in the first century church. For example, James and John wanted to sit next to Jesus in the kingdom. Their selfish desire was not received well by the other apostles. And that's an understatement. Then you remember the Jerusalem Council. The discussion was, should a person uh, be saved unless they have been circumcised or become like a Jew? Then we find Peter and Paul squaring off in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Peter came to Antioch, where he opposed Paul to his face, because he stood condemned. Why? Well, in one context, he would associate with Gentiles. But, another, but in another context, it seemed that he refused to associate with them. Prayer is such an important ingredient in the arsenal of any church leader because you see there is a spiritual dimension to most conflicts in the church. Here's another question. Can every church anticipate conflict and resistance in anticipation of change? 
The answer, obviously it's yes. Certainly when a church is changing, most people say, you know what, I don't mind change, but I don't want to be the one who changes. So you can anticipate conflict and resistance so don't go into a situation where change is needed expecting everything to be rosy. It will not be. Here's another question. Is it possible to totally resolve all conflicts in a growing or changing church? The answer is no. Any action or movement will generate heat and friction. And if the church is moving forward or growing, then there will be opposition and conflict. Question number four. Can you identify the common causes and or sources of conflict or pending conflict in the church? Yes, you can, because typically disharmony comes from the following sources. Different personalities. If an individual has a sanguine personality type, that is, they're very outgoing. They never meet a stranger. If they're paired up with a person who has a phlegmatic personality, that is, they're very studious individuals. They enjoy studying, but they really don't like to be around people all that much. These are two differing personalities that often clash, and conflict can be the result. Then there is different perspectives. Issues can have many facets, and sometimes people have different perspectives on those facets. People may take to different sides because they just simply see things differently. When individuals have a, a different perspective, it can cause conflict. And then even different spiritual gifts can cause conflict. For example, an individual who has the gift of mercy cannot understand why an individual who has the gift of evangelism doesn't practice more mercy in their evangelistic approach. And the person with the gift of evangelism is surprised because an individual that has, let's say, the gift of service is not as evangelistic in how they serve as those who have the gift of evangelism think they should be. In that sense, they are so very different in their spiritual gifts, and it causes friction, even in the church. And there can be different visions for the church or for the ministry, or different expectations. Or last, there can be even a disagreement over what causes sin and what sin really is sin in the camp, I've labeled it here. In the church, most friction is a blend of all of these different issues. In the Bible, stories abound that deal with conflict. Four biblical causes of conflict will be shared with you on this slide, but this is by no means a way of saying that this list is an exhaustive list. It's only an opportunity for you to see four causes. First, there was misunderstanding. This can be illustrated from Joshua chapter 22, 10 through 34. We find that there were uh, three tribes, actually two and a half tribes, that decided to stay in the nation of Jordan after the children of Israel entered the promised land. They were the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. They decided they would continue living on the east side of the Jordan River. As a result of that, they went away from the west area where the rest of the tribes of Israel were going to reside. And so we find that there was a conflict that arose because the people who were building on the east side of the Jordan River were building an altar. Those who lived on the west side considered it to be a rival altar to the one that had been erected in Israel. But this was not the case at all. It was just a misunderstanding, but conflict arose out of this. Those from the west side set out to actually exterminate the tribes of 
Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. But they met at the altar, and they began to discuss the situation, and they found out that the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh had no intention of using this altar in a rival way. They were not going to use it to offer grain offerings or burnt offerings or peace offerings. They weren't going to do that at all. As a matter of fact, they built that altar because they were afraid that future generations would not believe that this two and a half tribe group still belonged to the nation of Israel. And so they built it as a memorial. It would remind the descendants that they too had a right to worship the Lord at the sanctuary with burnt offerings, sacrifices, peace offerings. And they would offer those offerings on the altar in Israel. So this was just a misunderstanding that took place. Now, in addition to this misunderstanding, now, there also are other uh, expressions of conflict that we find. Differences. In Acts chapter 15, verse 39, there was a sharp contention between the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. You'll remember that those two had been inseparable and had been on missionary trips and engaged in the spreading of the gospel. But because a young man, John Mark, had deserted them on the first missionary journey for an unknown reason and had gone away from them and left them, abandoned them, that Paul was very offended. And so when Barnabas asked to include him in their next missionary journey, we find that there was a sharp contention. Barnabas wanted to include John Mark, but Paul would not lay down his grudge. As a matter of fact, they separated over this issue. We find that Barnabas went one way, and Paul went on a missionary journey in a different direction. And then, in addition to the two that we've already mentioned, there was competition. It's discovered in Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 through 12. Here we find Abram and Lot. They both had huge herds, and so the land was not able to sustain them, so there was competition over the land. The solution was that Abram would take one pasture area while Lot took a different one. And then sinful attitudes are another reason for conflict to take place. In James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, we read, and I quote, What's the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war and your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. And you're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Close quotes. So here we see conflict, even on the pages of the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. And now let me share a few observations about conflict. First, conflict is not always bad. The Bible teaches that some differences are natural since God has created us as unique individuals. Human beings will often have different opinions, convictions, desires, perspectives, and priorities. Many of the differences are not inherently right or wrong. They are simply the result of a God-given diversity and personal preferences. When handled property, properly, Disagreement in these areas can stimulate productive dialogue, encourage creative ideas, and promote helpful exchange and generally make life more interesting. Therefore, although we should seek unity in our relationships, we should not demand uniformity. See Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 13. Instead of avoiding all conflict or demanding that others always agree with us, we should rejoice in the diversity of God's creation and learn to accept and work with people who simply see things differently than we do. Not all conflict is neutral or beneficial. 
However, the Bible teaches that many disagreements are the direct results of sinful attitudes and behavior. We read James chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. We read those earlier. When conflict is the result of sinful desires or actions that are too serious to be overlooked, we need to avoid the temptation to escape or to attack. Instead, we need to pursue one of the peacemaking responses to conflict, which can help us get to the root cause of conflict and restore genuine peace and harmony. The Bible teaches us that we should see conflict neither as an inconvenience nor as an occasion to force our will on other people, but rather as an opportunity to demonstrate the love and power of God in our lives. Now we come to conflict can be an opportunity to glorify God. This is what Paul told the Corinthians, uh, Corinthian Christians, when religious legalities and dietary disputes threatened to divide the church. You can find that discussion in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 through uh, portions of chapter 11. This passage presents a radical view of conflict. It encourages us to look at conflict as an opportunity to glorify God, serve others, and grow to be Christ-like. On this slide, I want to discuss ways people respond to conflict. There are many different ways that people can respond. We will look at three. First is the escape response. The escape response, some uh, times in this way, individuals will simply deny that there is any conflict. When they deny it, they are reaching the point of moving beyond the place of being healthy. We cannot be like the proverbial ostrich. He puts his hand, head in the sand and he pretends that there is no problem. And then another escape response is to run away from it, to flee from the conflict. This certainly does not work because conflict will find you. And another escape response is suicide. Some people actually take their own lives as an opportunity to escape a bad situation. In 1 Samuel 31 verse 4, we see that King Saul committed suicide and it was an escape response. I would rather we all engage in peacemaking responses and that's next. Peacemaking responses include these items, overlooking an offense. Some would say that's denying, but no, it's quite different from denying conflict. When we simply offer grace to another person and overlook the issue and move on with life, then we are practicing a peacemaking response. For example, the pastor didn't shake hands with me on Sunday. Well, you just overlook that and move on. It's not worth being angry at someone over that. There is a reconciliation when two individuals have a problem and an issue arises. They can reach the point of being reconciled to each other, but only through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes negotiation is needed or mediation or sometimes even arbitration are needed but we need to be accountable to one another to engage in peacemaking responses. Peacemaking responses focus on us, whereas the escape responses, they focus on me. And then there are attack responses. Attack responses are the following. Assault. And I have known churches where literal fist fights have broken out. Then another one is litigation or lawsuits. They are the order of the day, aren't they? It would not surprise us to see legal action taken against the church. And then even murder has been committed at the extreme end of the attack response. 
and that has even happened among church members. If you are interested in knowing more about these responses and how to handle conflict, I would encourage you to read Ken Sandy's excellent book entitled The Peacemaker. Sandy, his last name, is spelled S-A-N-D-I. This ends this presentation for this week. May God bless you in every way.